Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's been good to be here this week. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. It's always good to, to go home. You know, when I, when I first left home many years ago, well, a few years ago now, anyhow, <laughs> 16 years of age when I left home to go away to school, and uh, since that time, it's always been good to go back home again. And it's good to come home to Garner this week. It's been a blessing for me. It's been good to be able to look back over the congregation and see folks that have meant a lot in my life and folks that I know have prayed for me a lot and to see folks that I have prayed for. And it's been just, it's been my blessing and my treat. And I thank you for this privilege and opportunity. And I pray that the Lord will continue to bless each of you and bless the ministry that he's given to this church. You know, when I drive through the area and just realize in, in a brief seven years how much has changed in the Garner area. But not only that, the thing that really came to my heart is, wow, look at all the new opportunities to reach out for Christ. Amen. God has placed you in a very strategic place. And God has given you great talent. God has given you some great faith. And my prayer is that God will help you to blend together your faith and your trust and your work for the glory of God. Not for the building of this church. I don't want to see this. I want to see this church filled. I like to see a time when come in here and be chairs up and down the aisle. But I don't want to see that happen just for Garner Avenue Christian Church. I want to see that happen for the glory of God. Amen. But that's what it's all about, is that Christ may be glorified in everything we do. And so, again, let me say it's been my privilege to be with you this week. And before I speak tonight, I'd like for us to pause for a moment and ask God by His Holy Spirit to touch each of our lives and minister to us tonight by His Spirit. Let's pray. Father, as we come to the close of these particular meetings, we're thankful that your presence will remain with us always. That wherever we are and wherever we go, because we know you as our Lord and our Savior, we know that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us, you will provide everything we need for every situation in life. And so, Father, as we look forward to the days that lie before us, days of opportunity, days that will be exciting because we're living in these last of the last days, days just before the coming again of our blessed Lord. Yeah. And Father, I pray that these days will be encouraging days for the church. May we lift up the banner and move forward in faith and in hope and in expectation of the soon return of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, Father, I pray that in the next minutes that we shall spend together, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to our lives, challenge us, encourage us, strengthen us, and send us forth to be your servants in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it true that everything that happens in life happens for a purpose? Is it true that everything that happens in life, something good is going to come out of it? Maybe it's a tragedy. Maybe it's a difficulty. But is it true that something good comes out of everything that happens in life? Let's find out. Take a few Bibles, if you will. Turn to me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And I know you already know the verse I'm going to read. Romans chapter 8. Verse 28. 
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, having read that verse, we already know the answer to those two previous questions. And the answer is simply no. Everything does not happen for a purpose. And something good does not come out of everything. You say, but that's what the verse says. But if you read the verse very closely, you'll find that that verse applies to only a select number of people. It does not apply to everyone. The verse says that this verse applies to those who love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose. So if we want to think about everything in life happening for a reason or a purpose or something good coming out of every situation of life, then we must say that that would apply only to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So then I would ask the question, then is it true that for Christians, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, is it true for those of us who love Christ that everything that happens in our life happens for a reason, good or bad? Or that in every situation in our life, that somehow, some way, something good is going to come out of that? Of course not. Let's see a young man, young Christian man, just been a Christian a few years and in the prime of life, driving down the road in his automobile obeying the speed limit, and suddenly someone runs through a stop sign, plows into his car, and for the next 30 years, he lies flat on his back in a bed, paralyzed. Something good coming out of that. Well, let's take a young couple young Christian couple, been expecting their first child and, and the child of their dreams is born. Less than two years, the child is taken ill and dies. Something good coming out of that? Well, let's say a, a Christian family that loves the Lord, worked hard, and suddenly one day, and we have someone here tonight like that, the house is burned. They lose everything. Something good coming out of that? The family has worked hard all their life, loved the Lord, served the Lord with all of their heart. Now in their retirement years and overnight... Because of a storm, a tornado, a flood, a hurricane, they're reduced to poverty, living on welfare. Something good coming out of that? What does Paul mean in this particular verse? That all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to this person. Listen, as long as this world lasts, as long as there is sin in this world, there are going to be times of trouble, heartache, suffering, pain, sickness, and death, even to Christians. It is not true that in every situation, somehow, some way, that that works together for good, everything works together for good to those who love God. Well, if that is true, then what does Paul mean when he says it in this verse? Well, if you want to get the real meaning of the verse, let's go back and look at verse 16. Go back and look at verse 16. In trying to understand Scripture, and I've said this to you before, you need to go back and read the verses preceding the verse you're looking at. 
It's easy to take a verse out of context and say, well, this is what the Bible says. It may say that, but it may mean something else if you read the verses prior to it. So look at verse 16. The Spirit itself, that's the Holy Spirit, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That is, we're born again, we're part of the family of God, we know Christ is our Savior. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, the very next verse, Paul recognizes that everything in life is not always pleasant. Notice what he says. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, Paul says, I've taken a look at my life, and I have been through a lot. I've been through a lot of suffering. I have been stoned. I have been beaten. I've seen other people go through tremendous suffering. Paul says, when I look at life today, I see suffering. I see pain. I see sickness. I see death. But then he says, as an accountant, I reckon. The bottom line is that the suffering of the present time, that's not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, if we can determine what that glory is, we will fully understand the 28th verse. Now, what is the glory that shall be one day revealed in us? Go over to verse 22. Read the other verses prior to, but let's get to verse 22. Paul says, for we know that the whole creation, that is everything that God has created, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What's he talking about? We know that all of creation in Genesis was subjected to a curse. That curse was mortality. That curse was death. All of creation. Man was subject to death, to decay, to suffering, to dying in Genesis. But so was the rest of creation. All of creation was subject to mortality. And Paul says, listen, we know. Look around you. Everything around you is dying. Animal life, plant life, everything around it, the whole creation is groaning under the curse of sin and death. Now, let's go on. Look at verse 23. And not only they, but those of us who are Christian, but ourselves also, which had the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, what's the first fruits of the Spirit? The Bible tells me when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, in one place it tells us that the down payment on our inheritance is the Holy Spirit. So when I become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live and reside in my life. That is God's down payment. That is God's guarantee that He is going to complete what He has promised. Okay, let's go on. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. Paul says, listen, those of us who are Christian, we are not exempt from the curse of sin. We're saved. We have the Holy Spirit living within. The Holy Spirit bears witness. I am a Christian. I am a child of God. I know Christ is my Savior. But he says, in spite of that, we still are under the curse of sin and we groan within ourselves. If I might pause to say here, a lot of Christians do a lot of groaning. <laughs> You see a lot of Christians and you don't want to ask them how you're feeling. You don't want to do that. Because for the next 20 minutes, they'll tell you all about their aches and the pains and the surgeries and, and the things that are going to happen down the road because I'm getting older. You know. But those of us who are, we still, we've grown. Why? Because we're still, even though we're saved, we are still subject to the curse brought upon us by sin. We still have a mortal body. And with that mortal body, we still are subject to pain and suffering and difficulties in life. But notice the last part of that verse. 
Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit. What are we waiting for? We are waiting for the redemption of our body. That's the bottom line. The bottom line for the Christian is simply this. We live in a world of sin. We live in a world of suffering. We live in a world of decay. We have a mortal body. We are subject to all of that. But we're waiting for that glory that he spoke of earlier. We are saved. We still live in a world that is lost. We're subject to all of these things in life, but we are waiting for something to happen. We're waiting for the time when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. And when that happens, something is going to happen in the life of every believer. We are going to be redeemed from the sin curse. Amen. There'll be no more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. That's what we're waiting for. That's the hope of the church. That's the faith of the church, that Jesus Christ is coming again. And even though we live in a world of pain and sickness and suffering and death, we're waiting for the redemption of our body. All of life for the Christian, good and bad, all of life is moving the Christian to one thing, the redemption of the body. That's the one thing. All of history, all of life is moving in that direction that one day something is going to happen and that is the redemption of the body for the believer. So if you want to go back and look at verse 28 again, you may look at it this way. The end result, the end result of all that happens in the life of the Christian will be the redemption of the body and that's good. That's what the verse really means. The end result, all things work together for good, that's the end result. The end result is that everything that happens, everything is not good, but for the Christian only, for the Christian only, the end of all things, at the end of life, at the end of all things, will be the redemption of the body, and that's good. That's what he's talking about. The redemption of the body being saved when Christ comes again. This hope, this assurance enables God's people to face the tough times with confidence. That's why you can go through your home being burned down with confidence. I'm not saying because your home burns down, something good's going to come out of that. I'm not saying because something bad happens in the life of the Christian that something good will come out of that. But I am saying this, that because I know Christ and because he lives in my heart, I know that everything that happens in my life, good or bad, one day is leading me down the road. The ultimate end is going to be the redemption of the body. Let me give you a little illustration that helped me a lot in understanding this verse. How many of you would like tonight to take a big tablespoon of shortening and eat it? I mean, just a big old spoonful of shortening. Or how about a, a cup of flour? I mean, just take a old cup of flour and just eat it right down. Or how about a... How about a how about a, a teaspoon of vanilla? Well, that might be so bad. But listen, you take all, well, a few more things too. But you take these and you put them all together. And you mix it all together. And when you mix it all together and you put it in the oven and 45 minutes later you take it out and it's a good cake. The end result is good. But those things individually were not good. I don't care how you look at it. There's no way in the world that a tablespoon of shortening is going to taste good. I don't care how you look at it. It's not good. But when you put it all together and it all works, the end result, the end result is good. Now, the individual things that happen in life may not be good. And most of you have lived long enough to have experienced some pain and suffering in your life. Some difficult things. 
And it has always bothered me to hear people say when someone goes through a difficult time, well, you know, something good's going to come out of this. You know, that's almost like a slap in the face. <laughs> that's not what Paul said at all. Paul said that for the Christian, everything that happens in life is the end result not these things themselves, but the end result of all of life, passing through life, passing through all of the difficulties, the end result will be the end of life will be the redemption of the body, and that's good. That's good. That's why Paul said in writing to the church at Corinth, one of the most favorite chapters, I guess, of Advent Christians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What did Paul say? If in this life only we have hope in Christ, what? We are of all men most miserable. If all we have is Christ now, and that's all there is, we go through life saying, well, I love the Lord, I serve the Lord, and we come to the end of life, and that's it. Paul says, you're the most miserable people in all the world. But now, is Christ risen from the dead. And because he lives, there is a guarantee, a guarantee that because I know Christ is my Lord and my Savior, I have a guarantee that once I go through all of life with all of its good times and bad times and suffering and pain and maybe death, the end result is going to be good. Because one day, I'm going to stand before Christ with a body that can never ever experience pain, sickness, suffering, or death. And that's what's good. That's what's good. Now with that in mind, turn with me to Philippians. Very quickly. Philippians chapter 3. I want to show you something. Philippians chapter 3. Knowing that, knowing that Paul says this is how we as Christians should live. Knowing what we have in the future. Knowing what's out there in front of us, notice what he says, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. In my Bible, I put in the, in the, I don't know if you write in yours or not, I like to write in mine. But in my margin, I have written, not circumstances. Don't rejoice in circumstances because circumstances can change. One day we can get and say, oh, wow, whoo, praise God, this is a great day, I feel good. Next day we get up and feel like death warmed over. <laughs> Circumstances change. Paul says for the Christian, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And then he goes on to say, you know, for me to write these same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Paul said, listen, it's not difficult for, it's not a burden for me to write and tell you to rejoice in the Lord, but you need to hear it. <laughs> you need to hear it. These folks were going through tough times. And Paul says, you need to hear this, that you need to rejoice in the Lord always. If that's not enough, go to the fourth chapter and the fourth verse, again in Philippians. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice that's the lifestyle of the Christian. Look at verse 6. Be careful for nothing. You know what that means? That verse really means don't let anxiety rule your life. That's what it really means. Don't let anxiety rule your life. But in everything, good times, bad times, what in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the result of that will be the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, how could Paul say that after what he'd been through? I'll tell you how. Because he had learned a valuable, tough lesson. What's the lesson he had learned? Drop down to verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11. Paul says, not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned. Here's the lesson he's learned. I have learned in whatsoever state or whatever circumstances in life, I am therewith to be content. Paul says, it hasn't been easy, but I've learned a lesson. The lesson has been this, that whatever my circumstances, I have learned to be content. Then he goes on to explain that in the next verse. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. 
Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now a lot of people like this next verse. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But you know what that really means? That means I can go through pain. I can do all, I can face suffering. I can face tragedy. I can face anything. I can do it through Christ which strengtheneth me. A lot of people today ever say, well, I'm going to come out on top. Everything's going to be okay. Doesn't mean that at all. Paul says, I've learned a lesson. My lesson is that I know how to go without. I know how to have. I know all of these. And I've learned, I've learned that I can do it through Christ. Christ will strengthen me. And then go to that very familiar verse, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, what is he going to supply? Sometimes he's just going to supply the stick to it in us to get through it. My God will supply whatever you need. When you're going through tough times, he'll give you the starch to get you through. When you're going through the good times, he'll be there to encourage you. Whatever you go through. Paul said, I've learned a lesson. Life's not always going to be easy. I've learned how to go without. I've learned to have. I've learned to go through suffering and pain and all of these things. But I've learned a lesson that my God is sufficient. My God will supply everything I need to go through what I've got to go through. Now, sometimes that's hard to understand. Sometimes we go through difficulties in life that we really don't understand. But one thing I do understand, that I have a God who loves me. And one day when it's all over, there's going to be the redemption of the body. Which brings it back in closing to two of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord. That's the Bible. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't try to understand everything. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, in everything that happened, good or bad, acknowledge that He is still God. He is still in control. And ultimately, all things will end with the redemption of a body in the kingdom of God. Now, I'm telling you, if that doesn't excite you, if that doesn't just put a shout within you, say, praise God, I can do it. I can go through life. I can face whatever is there, the hard times, the good times, the bad times. I can face it all because I know that all of life ultimately is leading me down here to the end and the redemption of my body in the kingdom of God. And I can make it. I can make it because he lives. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just love you tonight and, and I'm thankful, Lord, for your word. I'm thankful, Lord, that even though there are those times in life that we don't really understand, we don't understand what's happening to us. We don't understand the circumstances of life. But Lord, I pray that you will help us to learn the lesson that Paul learned. That we can learn that whatever circumstances of life we find ourselves therewith to be content because we have a Heavenly Father that sees us where we are, that loves us and cares for us and will give us the grace that we need for every day. And praise God. Praise God. I know my Lord is coming again. And I believe it's very soon that we're going to see our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. On that day, as Paul said, the sufferings of this life will not even be worthy to be compared with the glory that one day will belong to the family of God. Father, I pray that you will protect these whom I love. Watch over them, bless them day by day, meet every need in their life. Give them grace sufficient for every day. And on that grand and glorious day, may we have the privilege of living eternally in your coming kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen.